Hi, everybody. You ready for some Wall Street on trial excitement? Because I got the gavel, and I'm either pounding chicken, or this court now comes to order. That's right. Ladies and gentlemen, members of the jury, the diverse jury, very good to see you, wonderful to be here. We're gathered here in the great sovereign state of Nevada to decide the fate of Wall Street as an American institution. In this hearing, we hope to discover if on net balance Wall Street as a financial institution is worthy of praise and respect by the general public and the taxpayers of this great nation, or should it be consigned to the dustbin of history as a barbarous relic of vulgar capitalism? Does Wall Street in its many forms, investment banks, brokerage firms, hedge funds, money managers, and the financial services industry serve the public interest, or is it a nuisance that does more harm than good, and therefore, should it be punished and severely regulated and taxed and perhaps even nationalized? No. <laughs> in the past year, we have seen spontaneous Smelly protests occur in New York and other major cities around the world under the general banner Occupy Wall Street. Now, before this court, the prosecution will attempt to show that in sympathy with these protesters, Wall Street has tragically shifted from being a valued, respected, and vital source of capital investment and entrepreneurship to a perverse shell game of greed, corruption, scandal, excessive risk-taking, insider trading, excessive executive pay, and undeserved bonuses, special tax breaks, and casino-like gambling, fun, that lavishes benefits on partners, insiders, and big business at a time when Main Street is suffering. As a result, the prosecution will try to demonstrate that Wall Street has been a destabilizing and risky sector of the American and world economy, and partly, if not wholly responsible, for the latest financial crisis and unfairly bailed out by the taxpayers. In short, Wall Street is no longer a beneficial model of free enterprise capitalism. We have brought before this court Mr. Stephen Moore, mm, sexy, member of the prestigious editorial board of the Wall Street Journal, defender of financial institutions everywhere, and the conscious, conscience of Wall Street itself. Mr. Moore, will you please stand? Very good. You're already wonderful at taking direction. <laughs> Let's hear it for his standing. You, as a representative of the financial services industry and Wall Street in general, have been accused of greed, corruption, excessive compensation, social inequality, unnecessary model of free enterprise capitalism. We have brought before this court Mr. Stephen Moore, mm, sexy, member of the prestigious editorial board of the Wall Street Journal, defender of financial institutions everywhere, and the conscious, conscience of Wall Street itself. Mr. Moore, will you please stand? Very good. You're already wonderful at taking direction. <laughs> Let's hear it for his standing. You, as a representative of the financial services industry and Wall Street in general, have been accused of greed, corruption, excessive compensation, social inequality, unnecessary risk-taking, not paying your fair share of taxes, and causing the financial crisis of 2008. How do you and your supporters plead? Not even close to being guilty. Oh, no, you didn't. Really. All right. Well, we're going to begin the proceeding with a five-minute opening statement by the prosecuting attorney. Mr. Robert Frank. Mr. Robert H. Frank is the Henrietta Johnson Lewis Hyperlink Wiki Professor, backslash Cornell University, the Winner Take All Society, best of the Darwin economy. He's also the co author of the Ben Bernanke uh, popular textbook, The Principles of Economics. He earned his PhD from UC Berkeley. <laughs> Go Bruins! <laughs> and was a Peace Corps volunteer in rural Nepal. Fun. After the opening statements, each attorney will call two witnesses who will be the subject to cross-examination. Then each side will make closing remarks. Afterward, the jury will rule on the case. And if the defendants are found guilty, I will impose a judgment. Let me give a few instructions to the jury. Are you listening? 
Very good. You guys look so excited and sweet, so optimistic. You're going to listen very carefully to the opening statements and the witnesses, and at the end of this hearing, you will be required to determine whether there is sufficient evidence beyond a reasonable doubt, reasonable doubt, that Mr. Moore and his Wall Street supporters are responsible for public malfeasance. Is that understood? Oh, that's great. Very good. All right, Mr. Frank, you may begin with your opening statement. Go ahead. Thank you very much, Judge Kennedy. Uh, it's an honor to be able to present the case before this distinguished group. And I want to say that we have a very mixed uh, bag of opinions on our side of the issue. Uh, I am a registered Democrat. My two principal witnesses are registered Republicans. Mm. We come at this case uh, in a way that you might not have anticipated from our affiliations. Uh, you will hear John Mackey decry greed and malfeasance among Wall Street executives as somebody coming from the political right. You might have more uh, likely expected a message like that to come from Mr. Combs on the Fox Network. Go Fox. I, I will uh, try to guide the case towards what I regard as the core issue, which is that Wall Street may have committed malfeasance and be guilty of greed, but those are things we expect, after all, uh, from enterprise. The, the invisible hand theory does not require that executives be altruistic or public-spirited. They're in it uh, to make money, and the whole theory is predicated on the notion, and this is the, the theory that animates all of your faith and enthusiasm for free markets, that under certain conditions, we will get very good results for society as a whole from letting markets do what they do. Adam Smith, however, didn't believe that markets give you good results no matter what. Uh, anybody who doubts uh, that need only go to Somalia and watch truly free markets in action. Uh, Smith argued that markets worked well when certain preconditions were met. There were certain institutional uh, preconditions that had to be met. There were traits of character that were expected in the main participants of markets. When those were met, when we had the right institutional framework of property rights, laws, and regulations, and the right people in the positions, we could expect, in many cases, very good results from people seeking their own ends in the marketplace. Uh, it's not from the butcher or the baker or the the candlestick, the maker? candlestick maker or any, anyone else, uh, he wrote, that we look for our dinner. Uh, I guess we wouldn't look for our dinner from the candlestick maker in any event. Maybe you got uh, a fetish. No judgments. But we look, we look to them for our dinner because it will serve their interest to provide it. So uh, it may be correct to observe that Wall Street is greedy, but that's almost beside the point. We expect that in executives. The real flaw in the, the Wall Street industry has to do with the laws that shape their behavior. Those laws push them to act in ways that uh, our side will argue have, have made Wall Street uh, an unambiguous albatross around the neck of the nation's economy. It wasn't always believed to be so. Alan Greenspan, uh, who's familiar to members of this audience and who was uh, a very uh, enthusiastic supporter of financial deregulation, uh, said in 19, uh, excuse me, 2005, Increasingly complex financial instruments have contributed to the development of a far more flexible, efficient, and hence resilient financial system than the one that existed just a quarter century ago. Uh, when he spoke those words, there wasn't clear evidence to the contrary, although many people suspected that he was wrong about that point. Since then, of course, we've seen the financial uh, industry blow up uh, in, in our faces, and many more people are receptive to the notion that the rules that govern the financial services industry weren't optimally crafted for the problems at hand. When you press uh, industry observers to name innovations that have come from the financial services industry, that is to say useful innovations, many of them seem nonplussed. On reflection, uh, their responses contain scarcely a single item in common. That would be ATM machines, the one useful in innovation to come out of the financial services industry. The other innovations, uh, chiefly financial derivative instruments, are mainly seen as instruments whereby insiders are able to slough risk off on unsuspecting uh, bystanders and often create catastrophic instability 
for the financial system as a whole. The, the, the way we got here was by a very hasty system of deregulatory steps you undertaken in the 1980s. Uh, those steps, uh, our side will argue, led us to a much worse spot uh, and it would be much better for the country as a whole if it shed this albatross. Thank from you very its much, Mr. Frank. Very good. Well, now we will hear from Mr. Stephen Moore, the defending attorney in this case. Mr. Moore is the distinguished member of the Wall Street Journal editorial board and author of many books, including How Barack Obama is Bankrupting the U.S. Economy, and several co authored with Art Laffer. Great curve. <laughs> Rich states, poor states, the end of prosperity, and return to prosperity, how America can regain its economic superpower status. He received his MA from George Mason University. He is a strong advocate of the flat tax, social security privatization, and free trade. He is considered one of the premier supply side economists in the United States. Mr. Moore, will you give us your opening statement? Thank you, Your Honor. Very good. Thank you, members of the jury. I would like to start by saying that I believe that this trial is a farce and a miscarriage of justice. I work for the Wall Street Journal, so of course I'm going to defend Wall Street. I would submit, and the, our defense, Your Honor, boils down to this, that it is the wrong people and the wrong institutions that are being put on trial here this afternoon. Now let me start by saying, by uh, making some admissions about some of the mistakes that were made by Wall Street. We are all angry about what happened in 2008 and 2009 and the massive losses. We're all angry at the excesses of Wall Street. The ex I'll acknowledge the fact that Mr. Frank made that there was excessive pay to CEOs, that there were gaudy parties held by uh, many of the members of, of Wall Street, um, that there were criminals and crooks like Bernie Madoff, by the way, they are in jail where they belong. But I think it's important to understand that Wall Street plays an incredibly constructive role for our economy. In fact, I would say that Wall Street is the central nervous system that provides the seed capital that makes our $15 trillion free market economy operate and grow. What does Wall Street do? What makes it such an integral part of our economy? A lot of people can't answer that question. I would simply say the role that it plays, Your Honor, and members of the jury, is to allocate capital, scarce capital, to the highest value-added companies so that they can grow and create jobs and create profits. And I would submit that despite all of the mistakes that were made by Wall Street, and by the way, not just by Wall Street, I would submit everyone in this room. We all made mistakes. We all lost money. We all got carried away in the frenzy of the runaway markets in the late 2000s. But for the last 30 years, we'd all have to agree that Wall Street has done a tremendous job of funding the vital ca com companies in this economy, thinking of companies like Apple and Steve, uh, Steve Jobs, and thinking of companies like Microsoft and Bill Gates, and thinking of Walmarts and Home Depot and Google. And without Wall Street, if we put Wall Street in jail and shut Wall Street down, what we're going to do is deny the funding and the essential capital for the next generation of Googles and the next generation of Walmarts and Home Depots that not only provide wealth to investors and profits, but also create hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of jobs. And I would submit that no other country in the world has a more, uh, a more well-functioning capital system and financing system than the United States of America, and that happens with the investors in Wall Street. So we should remember that, that they are extremely important for our economy. Now, who is culpable, and who is guilty, and who should be on trial here, and, I, and who is responsible for the $11 trillion of losses? Well, let me tell you who I think that should be. Right, on trial should be Barney Frank. Barney Frank, who is the man who said that we should roll the dice on the housing market, and we would, did roll the dice, and Americans lost trillions of dollars. I would submit that Chris Dodd, the former senator for Connecticut should be on trial for having cozy relationships with the very types of people at Countrywide that he was supposed to be regulating. I would submit that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac 
should be on trial for providing 100 percent guarantees, taxpayer-backed guarantees for mortgages. And ladies and gentlemen, of all the bailouts we did, the two institutions that never paid back any of the money that we lent them as taxpayers were Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. And they should be on trial here. I would submit that the 435 members of the United States House of Representatives that voted for a $700 billion bailout of the banks, they should be on trial here. And so should the people who voted for the $800 billion failed stimulus plan. And most importantly, Nancy Pelosi should be on trial for running up the national debt by $5 trillion and putting our nation in financial peril. I would submit that S&P and Moody's should be on trial for giving triple, triple A bond ratings to mortgage-backed securities. Seconds. These are the people, ladies and gentlemen, should, that should be on trial. I would submit to you that Ben Bernanke should be on trial for his cheap money policies that have debased our currency. All right, thank you very much. Don't put, okay. don't put right. Wall Street on trial. Did he keep talking? Put government hey, on hey, trial. Hey, hey, hey. They're the ones who are I guilty. They're the ones who lost our money. And they're the ones who should be put oh, behind oh, bars in jail cells right, next to Bernie Madoff. <laughs> thank you, Your Honor. Okay, uh, all I'm saying is if they were the jury, you would be in so much trouble right now. <laughs> but they're not. They are. All right, thank you very much, Mr. Moore. Thank you. Take a deep breath. Mr. Frank, you ready to make it rain in here? Would you like to call your first witness? It's time for us to hear from John Mackey, the chairman of Whole Foods. <laughs> Mr. Mackey, would you please take a seat? We'd like you to take an oath to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Would you like to swear on the wealth of nations <laughs> or Atlas Shrugged? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Can I ask you one thing? Have you seen the price of arugula lately? <laughs> so expensive. <laughs> that was good. You're pretty funny. <laughs> I just need to say one thing. Um, uh, Mr. Frank, you, you need not insult me by calling me a registered Republican. Uh, you know, I have me. only voted Republican one time in 40 years, and I, I deeply regret that decision. I, I'm, I'm apologetic for the miscalculation. <laughs> the, what I did recognize you to be was somebody with a sincere appreciation of the magic of free markets and uh, very deep libertarian sentiments. Okay, and work it out in couples counseling later on. Let's get on with the trial. <laughs> and so I thought it would be especially interesting to hear your perspective on Adam Smith's notion that character counts in the marketplace and that we expect certain things of business leaders other than that they ruthlessly try to take as much out of the enterprise as humanly possible. Do you, do you have some experience or thoughts you want to add? Are that, you asking that, me whether I think business people should be ethical? That, that would be a starting question for you. Yeah. Do you think a business owner has uh, a responsibility to obey the law, even? If yes. His, if he can't get caught and his business would do better by not obeying the law, where is the greater responsibility, to the shareholder or to the, the law? He should obey the law. Unless the law is unjust, says one of the members of our audience. Well, if you... If you if they get feisty, by the way. <laughs> like, there's no controlling them once they get frothy, so you go ahead. If, if you see things on Wall Street that troubled you, what would they be? The, the way I see business is, I see business people as basically the heroes in this world, because business people are the value creators. We create value for our customers, for our employees, for our suppliers, for our investors, for our communities indeed for the whole world. It does trouble me sometimes that I think Wall Street forgets that it's a value creator. I do think sometimes it's, um, my, my company's been public for 20 years, so I've been dealing with Wall Street for 20 years, and it's a little bit of a love-hate. Uh, I do think they have created value, but I also sometimes think they have forgotten um, why they exist, what their purpose is. 
what they're supposed to be doing, and that troubles me. And what about in the domain of executive compensation? I know you have strong views about that uh, in terms of your own business. Do you think the, the people who head up financial firms on Wall Street are on the right track there, or what would your assessment be? I, I think ultimately those decisions need to be made by their board of directors and the shareholders who elect the board sometimes think they're maybe not doing a good job in corporate governance there, but I don't think that's a, something the government should be involved in, but I do, think, uh, I do think sometimes some of those salaries would seem to be higher than market rates. And is that something uh, for collective action, or you think the government really should just keep its, its hands off problems like that? Ask them to define collective action. Go ahead. Uh, the judge wants me to ask you to define no, collective wait, wait, action. I, I, ask him like it's from you. Go ahead. <laughs> I, I, I don't think I'm supposed to ask the questions. It's totally fine. <laughs> Some yeah, I, I do think it requires collective action, but I think that reforms really need to come from within the, the business community, from within the shareholders of companies within the boards of directors. They're the ones that ultimately have to be responsible. And I do, I do think they're not always doing their job well. And I, I basically, a lot of the corporate governance reforms that I'm seeing, I don't like all of them, but I think a lot of them are very positive. Uh, the last question I want to ask you about is a, about a fundamental distinction between the kind of business you run and the kind of businesses we see on Wall Street. So just imagine yourself in the role of baker. Uh, that's one of your roles, at any rate. When, when you sell someone a loaf of bread, the, the price the consumer pays you for that is a reasonably close track on the value the consumer receives, or else the, would, the consumer would go elsewhere. It's enough to cover your costs. So that's one of the preconditions Adam Smith describes for market incentives and social incentives to be in close alignment. So that, that condition seems met for your business. Do you, you have 30 seconds. Do you think that the condition is met as well for the financial services industry? Uh, not always, no. So for example, if, if uh, a financial services firm is confronted with a decision whether to invest in millions of dollars of computer equipment to make a forecast two minutes earlier. Why don't you wrap it up so we can answer? Excuse me? You've got no more time. No more time? Well, let him answer. He can answer quickly. Um, I'll give you an example. Uh, when my company went public in 1992, we did initial public offering, there was no price competition on Wall Street. They were taking a 7% cut of every dime they raised. Uh, and. Uh, that, that, that was not, you couldn't go out and negotiate 6%, you couldn't negotiate 5%. I thought that was a type of price collusion by the investment banking firms. And uh, uh, I, as far as I know, that's still kind of the clubhouse rules there. All right, very good. Thank you very much, Mr. Mackey. Your witness. <laughs> Mr. Mackey, uh, you mentioned the housing bubble. And I wonder, looking back on what happened with the massive overinvestment in housing that happened in this country. Um, who do you think is most responsible for that happening? Obviously, Wall Street took a lot of excess, excessive risks and banks made excessive loans, but do you, would you say that this is a result of, of uh, Wall Street, or would you say that when the federal government was providing 100% taxpayer guarantees that these mortgages, many of them which were incredibly flimsy and many of which people had, had no intention of ever repaying, when the, when the government is telling these banks that they will provide a 100% guarantee, who do you think is more culpable for creating this crisis, Fannie Mae or the bankers? I think they're probably both a little guilty, but uh, if you're asking me, I think Fannie Mae is a little, a little bit more to blame. Fannie Mae is a little more. So maybe Fannie Mae should be on trial here. <laughs> I didn't set the parameters of the uh, trial. Um, second question I had for you. You believe that CEOs are overpaid on Wall Street? Is that your contention? Or? I mean, uh, these types of decisions ultimately are, it's, you can look from the outside. Uh, their compensation seems to me to be uh, at times excessive, correct, yes. Now, 
Let me concede the point that many CEOs, for a minute, that many CEOs of companies and banks are overpaid. Then the question becomes, who do you think, in your opinion, is responsible for that? Or, or that is to say, would you favor the government coming in and telling companies what they can pay their CEOs, or is that a matter for boards of directors and shareholders? It's a matter for boards of directors and shareholders. Thank you. Um, the top 1%. Are you in the top 1% in income in this country? You're an incredibly uh, successful entrepreneur. I, I plead guilty. You plead guilty. So um, we've heard a lot, of this, a lot of this condemnation of my clients is based on the fact that a lot of these people got rich. Just, by the way, as you did. You got rich. People on Wall Street got rich. Is it a crime to get rich in this country? Uh, it, it appears that it might be becoming so. <laughs> um, <laughs> So, do you, can I ask you if you make over a million dollars a year? Do I have to answer these <laughs> questions? <laughs> well, let me, uh, let me rephrase the question, sir. Because that would be uh, super awesome if you did. Let me rephrase the question. Do you think how, how much money do you make a year? <laughs> there, are, there, are people, there are people in Congress who, are, who feel that they want to be so punitive, my clients, that they want to basically have a law that says no one should make over a million dollars a year. Is that the kind of thing that you would favor? I think that'd be very bad for the National Basketball Association. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well put. Um, very well put. Um, what, what, which late, late leads me to a question. If LeBron James can make 40 to $50 million a year to play basketball, is it excessive to pay a CEO of a major company that employs hundreds of thousands of people and maybe has control of billions of dollars of assets, 40 or $50 million? Not if he's as good as LeBron James, but the not. <laughs> Very well put. <laughs> okay, finally, and this is maybe most importantly, you started Whole Foods how many years ago? Uh, 30, about 32 years ago. How did you get the initial financing and the initial capital to grow your business? Begged everybody I knew. <laughs> Banks? Did you ever go to Wall Street? To start the business? No. Never. Uh, even, oh, yes. Stage. Oh, yes, of course. But not when we started so out. So here, here is my question. If we put Wall Street behind bars and say, shut these people down, wouldn't you agree that it would be extraordinarily difficult, almost impossible, for businesses like yours that hire tens of thousands of people to get the money that they need to, to grow their business? Uh, now, look, I mean, how are we going to run a capitalist free market system if we don't have Wall Street? Clearly, we need ways to raise capital. That's the purpose that Wall Street has. Unfortunately, it doesn't always follow that purpose, and that's why so many people are angry with it. Wall Street and the financial community need to remember what their purpose is and why they exist, and I think sometimes they've forgotten that. Finally, you have final 30 question. seconds. Are you more angry right now at Wall Street or big government? <laughs> uh, uh, let's see. Uh, <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with big government. Remember, sir, you are on your own. Thank you. No more questions, Your Honor. All right, very good. You may be excused. Thank you. He just wants me to move the witness chair. Is that okay with the rest of the jury? Great. Very good, Mr. Frank. Would you like to call your next witness? Yes. Uh, may we have Mr. George Gilder come to the stand, please? Please be seated over here. Mr. Gilder, sit down. I have a copy of the latest edition of Wealth and Poverty. <laughs> do, you swear, do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you Wealth and Poverty? I do. 